Welcome, I'm Terry Christensen and this is Valley Politics. Today we'll take a look at police community relations in San Jose, a controversial topic in cities across the country and an issue locally since the 1960s. We saw big protests over police shootings here in the 1970s and the movement to elect city council members by district rather than citywide was actually initiated by Latinos who felt the east side had no voice on the council when police practices were challenged. Demands for a civilian police review board ultimately led, as a sort of compromise, to the establishment of San Jose's independent police auditor in 1993. Today we'll talk with Walter Katz, San Jose's new police auditor, about his job, the efficacy of the office, and the current state of police community relations in San Jose. Later, we'll hear some residents' views on this topic, and then Shiloh Ballard will brief us on the work of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Then we'll close our show with part three of our interview with longtime county supervisor, Rod Dirit. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Walter Katz. So tell us about your job. What is an independent police auditor? Well, thanks for having me, Terry. Uh, the independent police auditor here in uh, San Jose, our primary mission is to uh, provide independent oversight of the complaint process. We do that primarily through the objective uh, review of misconduct investigations, which stem from uh, complaints made by civilians. And how do you come to this job? What prepared you to do this work? Uh, well, uh, actually, I began my career as an attorney in the 1990s. Um, I was a public defender in Southern California, mm -hmm. uh, first in San Diego County, and then in L.A. County at the Alternate Public Defender's Office. Uh, did about 15 years of trial work in L.A. County, uh, a lot of jury trials, uh, quite a few uh, homicide trials. And then, uh, because of some experience I picked up as a public defender, uh, mainly uh, the LAPD Rampart scandal of the early 2000s, really developed in me a keen interest in policing practices. And that segued into uh, moving over to the Office of Independent Review, which was uh, the oversight office established in LA County of the Sheriff's Department in the early 2000s. So you've been doing this sort of work for a while. Uh, the Los Angeles County Police, uh, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department has been a notoriously troubled department. Um, how would you compare what you experienced there with what you've observed so far here in San Jose? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because uh, I began at the Office of, in of Independent Review in November of 2010. And about three weeks later, uh, I got a phone call uh, one Sunday morning of a Christmas party involving deputies from the Men's Central Jail, which ended up in a brawl. Uh, so from that point onwards, all the way through 2000, uh, 2011, there were uh, the development of a series of newspaper articles and, and uh, television news pieces about mm -hmm. th the troubled jails. So I came from an experience there of watching a, a large agency which not only had to deal with, uh, which was in a crisis, uh, it was an, in a systemic crisis, and there were a number of federal investigations going on, not just inside the jails, but also out on the patrol side. So there was a definitely a department with uh, clear systemic issues, which is significantly different than what my experience is here. This is not a department which is in crisis. A different scale, too. It's a huge department in L.A., right? L.A. County. 9,000 deputies. 9,000 deputies compared to about 900 police officers here right now. Right. Uh, so you just uh, published your annual report, the police auditor's annual report, and uh, I had a good read of the report and noted that the number of complaints had fallen, but you seem a little skeptical in the report about the decline in complaints, like maybe some complaints are just not showing up, maybe some people aren't, aren't, aren't following through. Uh, so instead of celebrating the decline in complaints, you, you, you just seemed a little cautionary about that change in number. Well, my style is uh, a, a try not to judge too quickly uh, statistical changes year over year. Mm -hmm. And it's true that in 2015, 
uh, between our office and Internal Affairs, about 303 complaints were received. Uh, that is uh, the third year or second straight year of decline uh, from a peak of about 347 in 2013. I think any such uh, statistical changes, uh, one should be cautious about either celebrating it if it's downwards or necessarily criticizing it if it's upwards because there are a number of factors. Uh, and this year, or 2015 in particular, uh, there was a notable change. Uh, typically, uh, the IPA office receives about 50% or so of all complaints. And directly to your office directly rather to than to the police. A exactly, yeah. rather than to internal affairs. And in 2015, that dropped down to about 39%, and that was an unusual change. However, we attributed that to a number of factors. Uh, Judge Cordell uh, Your was predecessor a, in the uh, office. Yeah. Yes, she was a prominent member of the community, and her retirement was highly publicized. So we think some people may have thought that uh, the IPA was no longer in operation. Uh, secondly, we moved our offices uh, with very short notice uh, in late 2015, right before I came on board. And we saw a notable drop in, in walk-in traffic for the first uh, couple months and also at the end of 2015. So I think those factors helped decrease the numbers. But we'll see. If there's an overall decrease in the numbers over a period of time, that has to generally be viewed as a positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, you also report on officer-involved shootings. There were 12 in 2015. I think, let's see, six were fatal. Mm -hmm. Four involved individuals with mental health issues. You investigated only three. Why only three of the 12? Well, that is very specific to what the role of our office is. And every oversight office throughout California or throughout the country is slightly different in structure. And it's very much dictated by the design created by a city council. Uh, here, we're operating under a municipal code and also under the city charter, which mandates that our reviews of cases are those which are caused or come out of complaints. So if there's an officer involved shooting and there is no complaint filed by you can't investigate. member of the public, we don't review those cases. And that may, some people may perceive that as being too narrow, but that's what the law is right now. Well, does that really give your office enough power? Should you have more independent investigatory power? not dependent on complaints, not, and also not just investigating. You just actually review the police investigation of complaints, right? You Correct. don't have the power or staffing to do independent investigation. Do you think your office needs more authority? Well, I, uh, investigatory authority is, is a tough question because we've seen other oversight offices, uh, for example, in San Francisco or Chicago, which have that authority. And that may not necessarily mean anything. Uh, and, and the city and the community may not necessarily be better off of that. However, our role is to make sure that investigations are objective, thorough, and fair. But right now, it's only complaint investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the people of uh, the city and the community and also its leaders have to make a decision if that is the breadth of oversight that they want. Right now, we do not have the ability to look at all use of force, which would include all officer involved shootings. We do not have the ability to audit uh, internally generated, what they call department initiated investigations as well. Uh, so those are limitations created by our local laws. And I think uh, it may be time for uh, the community to have a conversation about that, if that is still the best practice uh, for police oversight. Are there groups in the community pushing for that? Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. You'd have to ask them, but yeah. it has come up in conversation as I've made the rounds throughout the community over the last few months and have come to meet, uh, meet various groups. It does come up during the conversation. Let's talk a little bit about bias-based policing. Mm -hmm. Your predecessor, uh, Judge Cordell, reported that Latinos and African Americans were disproportionately stopped and detained uh, by San Jose Police Department. Um, what are, what's the department doing? What are you, and, and what can your office do to address bias-based policing? Are we making improvements on, in that area? Well, let me tackle it this way, because improvements is a very subjective thing. Yeah. Now, I think that a lot of credit has to go to Chief Eddie Garcia for how he's addressed what appears to be uh, uh, a disproportionate impact on communities of color with traffic and pedestrian and bicycle stops. He's taken on a number of steps. He has had his leadership go through training uh, provided by the Museum of Tolerance. I know that the rank and file is going to go through uh, implicit bias training uh, with one of the nation's foremost experts on implicit bias in policing. 
And the third step is, is that the, the police department has contracted with the University of Texas El Paso. Uh, they have a research team which will be looking at the data which was collected previously and trying to understand what it actually shows. But that's on the statistical side. Mm -hmm. I think on a community side, and I've, I've experienced this from talking to a lot of people, not just here but elsewhere in the country have done this kind of work. Uh, on the community side, uh, there is a we know it when we see it kind of feeling. That I think a lot of people of the community in the community don't need to have a statistical table to tell yeah. them that they feel like there is biased policing going on. How to measure it, how to investigate it, is very t challenging because it's very subjective. Honestly, unless an officer says something uh, openly uh, racist or sexist, mm -hmm. it's very hard to prove that type of allegation. So San Jose is making some working to improve yes. in, in that area. Um, there are crises in police departments all over the country. Police chiefs are losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Cops are being tried in court for shootings and, uh, and other things. How do you think overall San Jose compares to what's going on in other cities? Well, I think there is no crisis right now, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, I do believe that Chief Garcia is actually being uh, very proactive uh, about looking at some of the best practices out there, such as, again, the bias-based policing or de-escalation training or crisis intervention training to try to improve uh, policing interactions be between officers and the mentally ill. Uh, there are other steps, though, which I think may be helpful to uh, definitely improve uh, how some certain practices are conducted. Uh, for example, use of force investigations, mm -hmm. which to a great extent right now, uh, they're not examined by internal affairs unless uh, there's a complaint behind it. Uh, and that may be too narrow of uh, a use of resources mm -hmm. to try to identify perhaps troubling practices or even perhaps uh, officers who may be using perhaps more force than they should. You also talk in the annual report about understaffing in the police department, down from 1,400 officers in 2009 to fewer than 900 today. How much of the problem of police practices in your, and for your job is actually related to understaffing in the department? You know, every action has a reaction. And you can see some departments who rapidly increase their police force and they actually walk into trouble. That's mm. one of the things we saw in the LA County Sheriff's Department were to increase officers by about 1,000 in 2005 through 2007. They actually lowered their hiring standards. Um, now, on the flip side though, when you have a rapid decrease in policing uh, with far fewer officers out in the street, it does have impact. If there are few officers in a particular area, there's less backup. Uh, if you have fewer sergeants out in the street, there's less field supervision. And this is something we noted in our year-end report. Uh, right now, how the police department staffs uh, their beats and their shifts is based upon seniority, uh, yes. basically bidding. So you literally have the least experienced officers yeah. working the toughest beats on the toughest shifts with sergeants who are also the least experienced working those same beats and same shifts. That's yeah, certainly been an issue in the neighborhoods that I work with. So precisely, those are the kind of more granular issues which I think have to be addressed, and those are the kind of things which do get enhanced when you have fewer officers. Now you have a large proportion of inexperienced officers, or of less experience at least, and you also have fewer officers there on backup. When you have that kind of a situation, when an officer is in a tense situation, where he has to make a split-second decision on whether you use force or even deadly force, it is helpful when you have backup there to make uh, a set of decisions that will hopefully not result in a member of the public being dead. And of course you can't do community policing if you're understaffed. That, that takes time. It takes time in neighborhoods. By definition. Overall and succinctly, is your job going to get easier or more difficult in the near future? I don't think that the job gets easier. There is a lot to do even when it's relatively quiet. And as you can see in some other cities, uh, crisis can occur without warning despite the best intentions of the police department and despite the hard work being, uh, being put in by oversight. Well, thank you, Walter Katz. We appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Now let's hear what some residents had to say when we asked them how police community relations in San Jose could be improved. You might notice a former mayor among those we talked with. Then Shiloh Ballard will tell us all about the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition.
my perspective as a resident of San Jose, you know, I think the police have been doing a great job. Um, I think they're much more, you know, they're very value add. Um, what I would love to see personally is actually more funding for police officers. Um, and I think that's been very difficult over the last several years because of, you know, some of the cutbacks, some of the changes in, in, in let's say, um, wages, et cetera. I think one of the most important things is just to have the police out on the streets, kind of meeting people, talking with people. Um, being part of the everyday community so that it's not just in an emergency situation when you are approached that way, then um, then you kind of have that rapport already built in the neighborhood. The police are the most important asset a city and its citizens have. Uh, the parks, the libraries, places like this, uh, they don't survive and they don't thrive without people being able to bring their families here. So with that said, uh, the department can always improve. Uh, the department has always prided itself that it was in and of the community here, that the women, uh, Hispanics, Vietnamese, uh, all were part of the police force and they had a very significant outreach there. So uh, the fact that they've gone from 1,400 officers to, to about 900 has really impacted them. But, you know, they're making immense strides and the new chief, Eddie Garcia, uh, is working hard to gain and regain any respect that uh, uh, the police department doesn't have now and I believe they'll be successful. I think that if uh, the police had more one-on-one -on -one where they walked the streets and introduced themselves to the locals and um, had a regular beat and that people got used to seeing them and got to know them and tr then they would in turn trust them. My name is Shiloh Ballard and I'm the executive director of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. As you might guess by the name of the organization, we're about getting more people to ride for everyday use because we know that it's good for human health, good for the environment, and good for the community. We've been around for over 30 years and we steer our work primarily into two lanes, infrastructure and encouragement. What do I mean by that? Well, we know that 60% of the population says that they're interested in riding a bike, but concerned. And their concern is mainly about safety. That's where the first area of focus comes in, infrastructure. For years, Silicon Valley has built streets so that cars could go fast. Changing that has not been easy, which is where the Bike Coalition comes in. We work closely with city staff and council members to advocate for spacious bike lanes and green paint to ensure that streets are safe for all users. One of our multi-year initiatives is to add bike lanes to El Camino, a heavily traveled corridor. That said, when you grow up in a culture that glorifies the automobile, even with the best bike paths, people still don't ride. That's why we also focus on behavior change and fun ways to get folks to shift gears and ride a bike. One example of this is Bike to Work Day. Every May, we organize several events to entice that 60% to try riding a bike. On that day, thousands of people will dust off their bike, pump up the tires, strap on a helmet, and pedal to work. And we know that when people throw a leg over a bike, they end up wondering why they have wasted so many hours sitting in traffic instead of feeling the wind in their hair as they pedal to work. Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition is a membership organization that depends on folks like you to support its work. We need you to encourage city councils to think of transportation in terms of kids walking to school, families riding to the park, and not solely the need for speed to work in a car. If you aren't already involved, join us at bikesiliconvalley.org and help improve the community, economy, and environment through increased bicycling. Thank you very much. Next on Where Are They Now, Longtime County Supervisor Rod Diridon, also known as the father of modern transit in Silicon Valley, talks about the launch of public transit in the valley as well as the establishment of the county park system. Let's take a look. Another important point in your life was 1976 when you pushed the county to put a transit tax on the ballot. Uh, 
money that ultimately built the light rail system and expanded the bus system. What made you think this county, this area where people get around mostly by driving, still, was ready for mass transit? Well, that goes back to my environmental leanings. I could see that we were filling in very rapidly because Silicon Valley was starting to uh, have a real effect. I could see that our highway systems were never going to handle the ultimate growth in the area. And I knew that pollution came from cars. And so we had to have funding to uh, build a mass transportation system. So I knew it was the right thing to do. Secondly, I knew from polling mm -hmm. that if we got the right people to vote, mm -hmm. we were going to win. Now, nobody believed that. But I trusted the polling data. So I knew that if we focused a campaign on the users of transit and the environmentalists and the labor people that were going to build yeah. it and didn't encourage the rest of them to come and vote, that we were going to win. And so we set it for a special election, not a regular election, where we'd vote out would be, voter turnout would be low. And we ran the campaign with the League of Women Voters, AUW, Sierra Club, League of Conservation Voters, and our precursor, uh, Committee for Good, Green Foothills, and the labor unions. Mm -hmm. And we won. And um, pretty, pretty well, too. I think it was 56%. This was one of the first locally funded it, transit It districts was the first in the, state. in the whole state. Yeah. And I think it paved the way then for Senator Alquist to carry, he carried that bill allowing us to go by ourselves. Mm -hmm. He then carried a bill with Jim Mills to allow any place in the state to go uh, with a local half, half cent tax, which was the bill then that became the, the bill that has allowed us to become a self-help county. So the system gets built. A lot of the light rail serves the west side and, and, and north up to Mountain View. Now you're, now, you're, now you're frowning at me, but my friends on the east side blame you, among others, for not bringing light rail to East Ridge, down Santa Clara Street, providing better service to the transit-dependent riders on the east side. What's your response to that? I'm pissed. <laughs> Pardon me, but I took all sorts of heat from the west side because I didn't fight for the Wasona corridor and the 85 corridor to be the first corridors built. And I had the votes. And I realized... That was your district. Yeah, that was my district. And I didn't get anything in my district when I was in office. Remember, the Guadalupe corridor yeah. is not the west side. <coughs> it's no. the central yeah. area. And the Tasman corridor is not the west side. It's the north side. Mm -hmm. Tasman East is the east side. All of those, and the Capitol Corridor, all of those came before the Vasona Corridor, yeah. which came after I was in office. So I fought for what was right, even though it wasn't for my district, and helped Dan and uh, 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 Diane McKenna and Blanca get their... Blanca Alvarado, all county supervisors. All from yeah. the east side, north and east side, yeah. because the area was more transit dependent. Right. And I, I, that was the right thing to do. Good. Thank you. And by the way, <laughs> remember, it wasn't just light rail. During right. that time, oh, yeah. I, was, I was chairing nine different rail projects. Caltrain, Altamont Express, the Capital Train, the uh, study to Santa Cruz, and the study of BART from uh, Fr Fremont to downtown were all studies that I began in the 1980s. Rod, we're almost out of time, but I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about what you think was your greatest accomplishment during your time in public office. Was it the transit system? No. No. I, I loved it, <laughs> and I had a lot of fun with it, but I think my greatest accomplishment uh, was the park system. The I was also designated to be the parks liaison during my time in office. And during that time, we went, first of all, I co-chaired the original park charter amendment with Susie and Dan and others that set aside money in the uh, property tax mm -hmm. for parks. A big chunk of it yeah. for acquisitions. Yeah. And when I then became lead on parks, 
I made sure that money went to buying a band of land as much as we could around the developed area to create a barrier through which you couldn't develop, which stopped urban sprawl. It did it pretty well, in, especially on, on the west side. The east side, they bought land further out mm -hmm. and allowed some urban sprawl. But the west side, we bought a, a buffer pretty well. Uh, uh, Sanborn Park, uh, Skyline Park, and so on, around through Las Gatas. And we went from 800 acres of county parklands when I was elected to 43,000 acres when I left office. And that's the legacy, I think, that the public's gonna see. They're not gonna know I did it, but I'm very proud to have been the lead on that. At the very end, I turned it over to Diane McKenna, and she carried on during her time because she served longer than I did before term limits took effect. Well, that County Parks Charter Fund has been uh, incredibly valuable uh, for the county and has really shaped the valley in significant yes. ways. So congratulations. Well, that's where, we'll, my, that's we'll where remember. my that's where my heart was. But I love the trains too. Uh, we know that. We wish we had more time to talk about trains. We know you've been a big supporter of high-speed rail, for example. Well, I chaired that for three years, served on the high-speed rail board for 10 years, and I'm still chair of the U.S. High-Speed Rail Association. We'll have to do another show on that. Not where are they now, but where are you right now on that? So we'll come back to you on that. I'll look forward to it. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Terry. On our next episode, we'll have the Lady of the Lake to tell us how Lake Cunningham Regional Park was created. Meanwhile, you can catch up on past episodes on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube. Just search for Creative San Jose. You can also email comments to us at valleypolitics at createvsj.org and you can follow us on Facebook where you can post comments and suggest topics or future guests. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching Valley Politics. See you next time. Do you care what's happening in your community? We do, which is why CREATV makes it a priority to bring you shows like Valley Politics, but we need your help. CREATV relies on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you to provide our community with informative local programming. If you like what you're watching, go to createvsj.org and make a one-time donation, or become an ongoing supporter through our friends of CREATV. Thanks for watching.